Hey guys, welcome back. This is International Master of Givon here, and today I'm back with some opening recommendations, opening theory. And I was thinking that after my last video on the French defense, I wanted to make also another video about the Caro Khan defense, just to make it kind of a, as a complementary video because. As you know, these two openings, the Karakan and the French Defense, they share a lot of characteristics. Black aims to play a quick uh, d5 in the center and establish a very solid pawn formation in the center. So today I'm going to be recommending against the Karakan one weapon that I think is a very practical and very dangerous weapon for white. If black doesn't know too much what to do, this is the two knights defense. So we have knight f3, d5, knight c3. This one is, I think, considered to be one of the main lines against the Karakan together with the advanced Karakan. And, um, and the open Karakan, the knight d2 system. So it's being seen in practice quite a lot. This contains a few little nuances and traps, which I will address shortly. Black basically has three serious options here, namely bishop g4, which is the main line, the very logical move. Also, he has the move knight f6, which is a pretty popular at top level, I would say, these days. And there is the move d takes e4, which is also fairly popular. But let's try, first of all, to kind of ward off some... Um, some other moves that also have been played. The move d4 might seem appealing and tempting to lots of people. You advance the pawn in the center, you create uh, a threat at the white's knight, but it turns out very quickly that after knight e2, because of the fact that black is deprived of the option of playing e5, he is forced to play c5 and basically move the same pawn twice. And after the move c3, Black basically has no adequate way to defend the pawn on d4. And if black is pushing his luck a little bit too far with the move d3, he will also lose basically all of his pawns after knight f4, threatening bishop takes d3, pawn to c4. White has this little tactical nuance of queen a4 check. And very soon white will collect the pawn on c4 as well as the pawn on d3 and black is already losing by move number 7. So going back to the position after c3, probably black's lesser evil option is to play d takes c3, after which white can choose knight takes c3, also b takes c3 is fine as well. White will very quickly push his pawn to d4. He will develop his bishop to some nice square. We see that already here a white has begun the game with a very nice small advantage of development, which is um, not something that you usually see in many openings. So after c3, another small detail which I wanted to address. Black cannot really play the move knight to c6, which would be the obvious move because of c takes d4. C takes d4, and here once one more time we have this queen a4 move. This is really a reoccurring motif in this line that you should memorize. Whenever black tries to defend the pawn on d4, search for that queen a4 move. And basically the pawn on d4 is lost because if black plays e5, white can use the pin on the knight and just take, take that pawn. And once again if black advances the pawn on d3, we have knight f4 and there is no way to maintain that pawn. So the main conclusion is that d4 is already a bad move, even though it looks very logical, and you might face this move in practice sometimes, especially in quick time control games. Let's move on. Let's speak a little bit about the move d takes e4, which is one of the three main lines. White obviously must recapture. And one of the really, I think, the main ideas of playing the two knights Karakhan is the following line. Many players will play in this position against you bishop f5. Why? Because that's a very logical move and that is also a move that they are used to being played. Uh, they are used to play in a, in a slightly similar position in another line of the Karakhan. 
So after bishop f5, the white knight is under attack. We must retreat it to g3. This is also a little bit of a tempo on the bishop. And after bishop g6, now we are starting to harass this bishop on g6, trying to use the fact that we have this knight on f3, we play h4, threatening to trap the bishop with the move h5. Black must play h6 to create a luft square for the bishop on h7. And now thanks to the well-placed knight on f3, we have this key move knight to e5. Now the threat is to take the bishop on g6, which really cripples black's whole pawn structure, so he must retreat on h7. And after this key move queen to h5, black is facing huge troubles, because he is now forced to play the move g6 to avoid an immediate checkmate on f7. And white is not even forced to move his queen straight away, he can play the intermediate move bishop to c4. Another tempo gaining development move threatening bishop takes f7 checkmate, so black cannot take the white queen on h5. And after the move e6, the queen retreats to e2. Not only white has a huge development advantage, there is a devastating threat of knight takes f7 followed by a quick checkmate. For example, knight d7, knight takes f7, king takes f7, queen takes e6, followed by queen f7 checkmate. Black is already losing. So, the conclusion is that the move bishop f5 on move number 4 is a move that is very logical or seemingly logical but is actually wrong. So actually after knight takes e4, black only has two um, kind of moves that considered to be pretty decent. One of them is knight d7, preparing the move knight to f6 with the idea that after knight takes f6, Black could recapture with the knight, thus not crippling his pawn structure. After which white should play the simple developing move bishop to c4, aiming at the pawn on f7. And after knight f6, white has this, once again, little idea to disturb black's natural development with the move knight e to g5, threatening checkmate on f7. Black is forced to play e6. And now white plays a very important thematic move, queen e2. Remember this triangle of pieces, queen on e2, bishop on c4, knight on g5. This triangle of pieces creates a lot of tactical problems for, for black. We have already seen a similar scenario a couple of moves ago with the knight on e5. Knight takes, f, knight takes f7 is being the main threat. So for example, if uh, black plays... Uh, some um, nonchalant type of move like bishop e7, after knight takes f7, king takes, queen takes e6, black is already losing because white's attack is irresistible, next move is being queen f7 check. So knight d7 is not the move I can really recommend for black, most of them play on move number 4, knight f6, after which I'm recommending to still go queen e2. Setting up a little trap, which is actually pretty nice if black is not too much, not paying too much attention. If black once again plays knight b to d7 with the idea to take the knight on e4 followed by knight f6, he will face a very, very unpleasant surprise with knight d6 checkmate. Not every day you see such an early checkmate in chess. So after queen e2, Black is forced to take the knight on e4, play knight d7, and here, thanks to our previously mentioned motif of uh, putting the bishop on c4, knight on e5 or g5, and the queen on e2, we know that the correct move should be once again bishop to c4, very natural developing move, knight on f6, and here, pay attention to this little intermediate move, knight to e5. This is already... I think not the first time in the variations that we examined today that we see that white is basically ignoring the fact that his white is being uh, attacked because of um, a checkmate threat. This is forcing black to play e6. And only now white can retreat his queen to e2, having a very big benefit of forcing the move or, or maybe provoking the move e6, which makes sure that the bishop on c8 will stay there 
basically forever. White is having a very nice position. So, after dealing with the move d takes e4, uh, let's move on to the move bishop. Sorry, let's move to the move bishop to g4. This is statistically the main line, even though I think in the last couple of years it's less popular than it used to be. The idea is to not only pin the knight on f3, but also to allow black to play the move e6 without blocking his bishop on the c8 square. White plays h3, him immediately putting black's bishop in, in question of whether he wants to just trade on f3 or go bishop h5. Many people will play bishop h5 in this position, trying to preserve the pin on the knight on f3. The problem with the move bishop h5 that now this bishop is kind of missing on this diagonal, so it would be more difficult for black to block some checks along the a4, b5 diagonal. So here we play e takes d5, forcing the move c takes d5, bishop b5 check, knight to c6, it's forced. Now the knight on c6 is pinned, so we try to take advantage of that by playing g4, bishop g6, and knight e5. You see that white is exerting pressure not only against this knight on c6, but also against this bishop on g6. So at any given moment, white can take this bishop. Black is forced to play rook to c8. And now after the following sequence of d4, e6, White can play the move pawn to h4, threatening to basically trap that bishop on g6 and to gain a piece, forcing black to play the move pawn to f6, after which white can trade off, use this little tempo with queen d3 to develop his queen side, also pretty much forcing the move king to f7, so we see that black is completely deprived of the option of castling. Obviously white is not going to castle short in this game because he has compromised his king position way too much. So he has to take on c6, removing one potentially dangerous piece on the king side. And after rook takes, bishop to d2, white is planning to play long castles and start attacking the black king with a timely h5 break. This is why most Karakhan players prefer not to play the move bishop h5. We need to remember that the move bishop h5 in itself is considered to be a very positional, solid type of move. Many people would prefer not to go into some kind of unclear, difficult type of positions. So most people will take on f3. Queen takes f3, which is nice for white because he gained the two bishops advantage. And now black plays normally e6. In this position, the position is objectively very very close to being equal. Lots of games in the database are being um, basically ending with a draw. That doesn't say too much about the position because I think the average viewer watching this video is still not 27, 2800 rated player. So um, in this position I'm going to be recommending two types of setups for white. Neither of them bring white uh, I think any objective uh, big advantage but is basically giving white the freedom of choice of in what whichever direction he wants to take the game towards. If white wants to play very aggressive he can go d3 with the idea after for example knight f6 to play bishop d2 and just castle long and later on go for a kingside attack with moves such as g4, g5, h4, h5. A little bit similar to all kinds of Sicilian defenses. This would be the sharp option. If white wants to play it safe, be kind of on the, on the, on the safe side, not taking too much risks. He can just play the move g3, which I also played myself in a couple of occasions. The idea is to, to fianchero this bishop on g2 and castle short. For example, knight d7, bishop g2, knight f6. Short castles. And in the long run, white is 
having that small but solid two bishops advantage. At some point, he will push his pawn to d4, try to open up the position a little bit, and hopefully, at some point, the two bishops will uh, start to tell, and white might face uh, some winning chances, especially um, once the position opens up. So that was um, all about the move bishop to g4, which is a good move, one of the main lines, definitely a move you are going to be seeing. And last but not least, the move uh, knight f6, which I kind of wanted to keep keep it for, uh, for the end, because I think it became really popular in the last couple of years, especially in Grandmaster practice. It's a very provocative move, because it allows white to push e5 and force the knight to move again. So, um, this, is a, this is one of those positions where, uh, where black needs to make a pretty serious choice about where the knight should go. Uh, obviously, black's intention is not to go back on g8, so black is kind of forced to play an active move, knight e4. By the way, if black plays the move knight d7, as white, I would probably consider the pawn sacrifice pawn e6. After pawn takes e6, pawn to d4. White is the pawn down temporarily, but he has very free going development while black is extremely stuck there. I really dislike black's position here. So after knight e4, um, if, if white just takes on e4, it doesn't really bring anything special. Black will recapture with a tempo against um, the white knight. So here we're going to play a clever move, which is knight to e2. As the arrows suggest, the idea is to specifically not to allow black to exchange the knights on c3 and basically try to push it away with the move d3 on the next move. So after knight e2, uh, black should play queen b6, use the chance to threaten checkmate on f2, forcing white to play d4. Black plays e6, preparing a a counter-attack in the center with c5 and knight c6, a little bit similarly to the French defense. And now one more slightly surprising move, a little bit in the spirit of the previous move of knight e2. Here we play this move, knight f to g1. Not every day we can come across such moves. The idea is should be obvious by now. We want to push that knight away. Actually, right now, that's a threat to win the black knight on e4. So black is forced to play the move pawn to f6, after which uh, white continues with f3. Black is forced to play knight to g5. And after e takes f6, g takes f6, white once again pushes his pawn to f4. And this position is extremely uh, unclear, I would say, like uh, very much, very much complicated, very much interesting. I think uh, it's a very fun position to play for white. If he is well prepared, he can pose some serious problems even to a very well prepared player. One game I can point you towards is the game Alexander Grishchuk as white versus the Dingley Wren from 2016. A very much top game. So for example, black goes back on e4. White can now play the move knight to g3. So we can see that the black knight on e4, while being very strong, is soon going to be exchanged. The black's king position is slightly compromised and white is threatening to go queen h5 check. And uh, later on white will finish, or try to finish his development with the regular moves knight f3 and bishop d3. And uh, once again, this position is very complicated, very interesting. I, there is still no clear verdict at the moment as of what is the objective evaluation of this position, but definitely for the white players who are trying to seek for a slightly more double-edged complicated game versus the Karakhan, 
versus the more kind of solid and um, unclear main lines that um, most black players with the Karakan, that, that that's what they basically expect to get. I think this kind of position for them is um, is a less convenient choice. So I really hope to enjoy this small um, kind of introduction and explanation to the two knights Herokan. For those of you who are interested to play this variation, I definitely recommend going uh, in slightly deeper uh, research and um, basically looking at some good games by strong players from the database. Anyways, hope you hope you to have a lot of success with this line and i'll see you in the next videos cheers guys cheers <laughs> cheers guys bye bye